Hey, today we are going through um, Romans chapter 6. So if you have your copy of the scripture, I want you to follow along with me. We're going to read it, briefly unpack it, and then a lot of neat activities are going to happen this afternoon. So I want to get you out on time. Romans chapter 6, and we're just going to retread just a little bit, go to verse 14. For sin will not have dominion over you, the Apostle Paul writes, since you are not under law, but you're under what? Okay, let's try that again. You're not under law, but under what? Grace. So keep in mind, Paul is writing to a group of newborn in Christ Roman Christians who live in a culture that is about as pagan as you can get. So they hear this new information that, hey, when I'm justified in Christ, all this do and don't stuff is gone. So how cool is that? Heaven when I die... And sin will I live, right? And so Paul says, hold on. Look at verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? And Paul is going to say, hold on for a second. By no means. Listen, don't you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you're committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become servants or slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now... Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. And what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, and the fruit you get to lead to sanctification and its end, which is eternal life. In the classic verse, 323, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, let me just kind of get you caught up to speed. Romans is a, just a, 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 treat, a treaty on, on what it means. It's foundational to our faith. So, uh, if, if you have been here, you know the word justified. Paul is writing that because we're so messed up and we're in Adam, we experience not only physical death, but we experience spiritual death. That, experience, uh, that spiritual death has created a gap between me and God, which I, by being good, cannot build a bridge over. The only way I can be reconciled or brought to God is through faith in Jesus Christ. And in the legal term that Paul uses is justified. At the very moment when I entrust my life to Jesus, I am made completely and permanently righteous before God. I don't have to do anything to maintain it. I don't have to do anything to keep it. I don't have to do anything to get it. It is by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when that happened, I was moved from being a sinner to literally being in Christ. And before I was in Adam, I could not help but sin. I couldn't resist it. I couldn't say no to it. It pulled the puppet strings of my decision-making capacity. I was sin slave. But at the moment I was justified, the label of sinner was removed. It was paid for by Jesus Christ. And now God permanently sees me as righteous before him. So last week we talked about this quandary that we're in. If I am completely free and permanently free from the power and control of sin, why do I sin? If, if I don't have to say those things, if I don't have to think that way, if I don't have to carry on this bitterness, then why do I? Because here's what I know, and if you're a justified Christian, if you're in Christ, you know this. There are times, more often than not, I don't feel free of sin. As a matter of fact, it seems like the feelings of temptation 
It feels like now that not only have I believed in grace, I'm trying to live in grace, the allure of temptation is almost greater now that I have Christ in my life. Have any of you ever experienced that? It seems like the temptation to do wrong is stronger. It's like when your parents as a teenager said, don't you dare. That in teenage, you know, mine meant I'm going to try it, right? This is going to get the adrenaline pumping. And so last week we talked about, Paul said this, don't present yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness. Well, what does that mean? So, I I borrowed Michael's Mr. Potato Head today to illustrate what it means to present yourself as an instrument of unrighteousness. Remember, I am not a sinner saved by grace. I am a son or a daughter of God who struggles with sin. So if I'm righteous before God, and I don't have to sin, then what does it mean to present my members... My, my body parts as an instrument of unrighteousness. Well, let me give you an example. How many of you all right, have limited getting uh, ready for church space in your home, like a limited bathroom space? Anybody have that? Okay. All, all the women are raising their hands. You hog it. What are you raising your hand for? All right. Okay. So say this morning you're getting ready for church, and you know the kids are always running, and it started to get a little mouthy, and you know your husband's running late, and you know what you need your just you time in the mirror to beautify and testify, and you know get 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 all gorgeous and whatnot. All right. And so it's just not going well. Honey's late in the shower. Uh, he got up early. Hogged all the hot water. Any ladies have husbands that hog the hot water? Okay. Okay. Hey, Amy, what do you? Have? <laughs> Wow. Okay. All right. And so you just, you're, you're kind of feeling the tension. You're kind of feeling it. And sin comes along to the justified D6 home and comes up and says, Hey, honey, can I borrow your mouth for a few minutes? Yes. I'm tired of taking these cold showers just because he's the reverend. He gets all the hot water, right? Okay. And so all of a sudden, sin grabs your mouth. And you go in and blah, 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 or whatever your wife does, blah, 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 you know, like that, right? And the kids hear it. The dog comes upstairs and wants to watch the fight, right? The dog wants to get involved. And all of a sudden, the teenage girls see it. And the teenage guys, and Sin says, hey, little justified teenage girl, can I have your my- mouth? And she's like, yes, all right, there you go. Like, a, yes, all right. And so she does, and they kind of do all that right? And then a teenage boy gets up, what's all this griping and complaining about? We're at D6 home. We had devotions last night. We're going to pray. And sin knocks to the teenage boy and says, hey, can I have your mouth? He's like, well, of course. This is unbiblical. We should do this right. And so he kind of starts going off. And all of a sudden, a family, a D6 family committed to Christ, justified by the blood of Jesus, just devours one another before church. Then you walk in and You kind of fake it, right? And then you'll get done here and you'll sit at Izzy and Eddie's or Jim Dandy's or if you're really a big spender, Burger King, all right? And you'll sit there and all of a sudden you'll be overwhelmed with guilt. And you'll kind of be silent. And then you'll get home and you're, you know, dad's a D6. He's he's the guy. All of this started with him and your wife's like, if he wouldn't have hogged the water, this never would have happened. And then your, your daughters are like, you and dad are always fighting. It just makes me out of sorts. And you know, and right? And it sounds like all we do is fight. All you do is argue. And we sit in church and everyone feels a little guilty. Right? Presenting yourselves as members of instruments of unrighteousness is this. It's when sin asks to borrow your members. And you don't have to. But you say, yeah. And then you live with the guilt and the shame, and the devastation that comes. Presenting yourselves as an instrument of unrighteousness is a guy that's growing up, he's, he's growing in a corporation, and he takes a business trip, and he gets on the plane, and he lands, and he checks in at the, the courtyard Marriott, and Sin says, hey, can I have your eyes? I mean, your wife's gone. You know, you're here with a couple other guys. It's kind of late. We've got a long day tomorrow. What do you think? Let's just go down to the bar, and let's have a Coke. Sure. And then you go down there, and there's a couple other businesswomen that are there on the business trip. And all of a sudden, Sin says, hey, can, can I have your eyes? Sure. I mean, it's not like 
I'm going to do anything. I'm just going to, going to peek. I'm going to like be a little flirtatious, but I'm smart enough. Listen, the tiger in the living room, the sin, I can tame it. I can control it. Nothing's going to happen. And all of a sudden, you give sin your eyes and look at me. You start entertaining things that you know if you did them, you would lose everything that you value. And you said yes to that. And then you go back to your room. A couple guys are in there. Man, that that lady was pretty hot, huh? Hey, I, I saw her talking to you. As a matter of fact, when you came up to the room, that lady was asking about you. And all of a sudden, sin says, hey, can I have your mind? Sure. Sure. Then you get back to your, your room and they're gone. And all of a sudden, you, guess what? It's, it's free cable. You get all the, the fun channels. And all of a sudden, sin has your eyes. And in a span of 24 hours after being in church, you have given permission for sin to do whatever it wants with the eyes and the mouth and the mind and the heart that Jesus literally was beaten beyond human recognition, crucified, and mocked for you. And then you'll go home, you'll get off the plane, your wife will pick you up at the airport, and you'll look her in your eyes, and you will lie to her, and you will carry shame and guilt. And then in two weeks, when you take the same business trip, and you know exactly how this will go down, this very same thing scenario will play out, and is a justified, forgiven person who believes in God's grace and is desperately trying to live it out, sin will come knocking, and you'll say yes. And Paul is going to talk to you very plainly today that why in God's name, when you don't have to, do you choose to yield to give away. Grace doesn't look that way. Grace doesn't think that way. Grace doesn't talk that way. In the mess, in the guilt, in the shame that you carry around and pray to God no one ever outs what's really going on inside of you. You don't have to live that way anymore. But you choose to. So the the part of us that is doing this, going to the next slide, is not you. And the tension that we carry is, if I I am free from sin, and I'm no longer a slave, why do I feel that way? And beyond that, why do I, who know myself better than anyone else, live this way? When I don't have to say yes to sin, having my lips, having my mind, having my eyes, having my heart filled with bitterness, when God has forgiven me for so much. Functionally, I feel feel like I'm still a slave. So therefore, God's grace really isn't greater than sin. Right? Paul's going to say, wrong. As we go to the next slide, we gave you an incredible challenge last week. That the, the sin that you wrestle with is not you. It is your flesh. And we have this assumption that when I choose and say yes to Jesus, and I'm declared completely and fully righteous before God, that all of a sudden the allure of flesh will vanish, that it will disappear, and it will go away. Look at me. It does not. The temptations that you feel and have in your areas, the most, the, the areas where your greatest invulnerability many times will be with you for the rest of of your life. As a matter of fact, when you truly desire to live in God's grace, it's almost the temptation gets hotter. It's almost like the allure gets stronger. But what can change, hear me, by the power of God's grace is your response. And Paul would say in verse 14, You're you're no longer under law. You're under grace. You are dead to sin. But you are alive to God. And so as we go to our next slide, let's unpack this real quick. So when he tells the Romans that they're not under law, but under grace, we kind of covered this in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. But the reality of it is that Paul's going to go on to explain, as Sam goes to the next slide, is you're one of two people. You either are a servant of God or you're a slave to sin. 
Now, the, the actual truth about you, that when you were justified, you were made a servant of God. You are completely righteous before God. But what Paul's going to wrestle with next week, the next two weeks in Romans chapter 7, it is possible that a freed person, by their own choice, by not allowing grace to do by design what it was made to do, that's to annihilate, decapitate, take the blood out of sin, so that no longer you give in to it, no longer is it characteristic of your life, no longer is your identity in, in the bad things that you do, your identity is in Christ. And that's why Paul would pray to all that he wrote to, my hope for you is Christ in you. It is the hope of glory. And so Paul's going to say, he's going to remind us, and by the way, the people that would say that the people that believe the Bible are just people that can't cope with life and they're intellectually not wise. Paul is going to use a logical argument. And he's going to restate it three different times of why in the world, when you're free from the power of sin, would you continue to say yes, yes, yes to being a slave to sin? So he says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. And here's what he said. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So Paul's going to make this huge point, you ready? That when you say no to grace, when you inhibit grace doing from by design what it's meant to do, and that's to destroy sin and to make you functionally righteous, that you're not really doing your own thing, you're doing sin's thing. That there really is no independent contractor so by saying yes to sin, you are kind of... Poor. What's the old Andy Griffith show? Who was the guy that would go into the jail cell and lock him up? What was his name? Oh, I, oh who said that? Otis? All right. You, you are spiritually Otis. You're absolutely free. And it's like, hey, Andy, what was the guy that... Would you, uh, what's his show? Barney what? Pfeiffer? No, Barney Fife. There we go. Okay. Sorry. My bad. All right. But anyways, um, he would go, remember watching that? He would walk in, he was drunk, and he'd lock himself up. Paul would say, you know what? Stop being Otis. All right? Because who you choose to yield yourself to, that's who your boss is. Paul later on would go say this, don't you dare say you love Jesus and you continue to say yes to sin. Because Jesus would say this to his disciples, if you really loved me, you would obey me. You would stop giving in to what has been already taken away, the power of sin. Paul continues on. I like that. Stop being a notice. Here we go. Look at verse 17. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin. You've become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching of which you were committed. Hey, here's what Paul's asking. Many of you believe in grace. Many of you desire grace to clean up the consequences of your sin. But when, when are you going to, by grace-driven power, begin to live out and commit to walking in God's grace? Because we want grace, hear me, when we give in to sin and the consequential fallout of sin, we want grace to kind of put it all back together. And Paul says, listen, yielding yourselves as instruments of righteousness is ahead of time learning by the power of grace. I can say, no sin, no sin. There we go. All right. You cannot have my mouth. No sin. I'm going on this business trip. And when all the guys want to go down to the bar and kind of hang out, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the Coke machine. I'm going to get my hummus and I'm going to get my celery and I'm going to sit and I'm going to watch ESPN. Why? Because I do not want to put myself in a position when the overwhelming power of sin that I be freed from, I'm so weak, I've got to distance my proximity from the temptation. And Paul is asking you, when are you going to stop just believing in grace and begin to literally walk in it by your grace-driven 
effort of saying, no, I'm dead to sin, but I'm alive to God. He continues on. Here's what he says, and it's kind of insulting. Uh, um, Look at verse 8, verse 17. But thanks be to God, you were once slaves from sin. You became obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you're committed. So having been set free from sin, you become a slave to righteousness. Now, Now look at this. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Now, as we've been going through this series, all of us think, Kevin, why don't you just move on? Why did we spend five chapters, three chapters on how bad we are? Why do we spend two chapters on justification? And all Paul does is hammer sin, justified, in Christ, free from the control of sin. And I love this. He says, listen, I'm telling you this using the terminology of slaves because it's hard for you to get it. In raising your kids, have you ever had to repeat yourself so that they would clearly understand the principle? Raise your hand. Multiple, multiple, multiple times. And why do you do that? Okay, Damien's like both hands up, all right? Both hands up, right? The reason we do that is because this is so important, but yet it seems like it's so confusing. Now hear me. What Paul is going to do now is he's going to take sin... And he's going to personify it. When we get to Romans 7, and this is a huge thing. If you read Romans 7, and I've been reading it and reading it and reading it, and it gets confusing. So what Paul's going to do is he's going to, I want you to think of sin as a separate personality from you. That you in Christ are righteous. That's who you are. Sin is a separate part of you. It is your flesh. Your flesh will never be redeemed until it dies. But what Paul says is, I discipline it. I say no to it. As a matter of fact, Paul would say, I literally, Floyd Mayweather it, I beat it to bring my body into subjection so that I will stop saying yes to sin and be alive to God. Sin is no longer you, and you are no longer sin, because you are in, say it, Christ. And so then when we read Paul, it says, it's not me that sins, but it's the sin that lives within me. And when we sin, we have a tendency to think, now it's me against God. Uh -uh. It's always you and God against God. Sin. That sin is this part of me that until my body dies and is resurrected and I receive my glorified body, it will always tempt me. It will always say, come here, buddy. It will always ask for my eyes, my ears, and my heart. And Paul says this, by the grace of God, I am not my flesh. I am in Christ because I am dead to sin. Say it, but I'm alive to God. And so Paul would say this. He goes on. Verse 19, I am speaking to you in human terms because of your natural limitations. And here he goes again. He's going to repeat it again. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Here's what sanctification is. It's taking grace... And saying no to sin. It's taking grace. It's taking God's word. It's taking the the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And saying, you know what? Before, when I would go on that business trip, I, I just naturally did this. It just seemed natural to say yes to sin. Sanctification is when grace steps in and says, "Uh uh-uh. Uh-uh. Remember, grace is greater than sin. If grace walks in a room and sees sin sitting over here, grace doesn't ignore him. Grace doesn't act like he's not there. Grace goes over, picks a fight, and kicks him out. And so sanctification is the kicking out of sin by grace having its perfect work in you. And Paul would say, let grace do what grace does. Stop getting in the way of grace. Man, look what he says. Man, this is awesome. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, when you were in Adam, you didn't care what was right because you couldn't do what was right. And when you lived that way, what did it produce? Look down in your Scriptures. It produced shame 
And in the end, death. Now here's a huge thing to walk away with today. That even if you are justified, if you, like Otis, continue to choose to live as a slave to sin, you may go to heaven, but as you live as a slave to sin, things in your life will die. If you continue, even in Christ, to live as a slave to sin, you will go to heaven, but things in your life will die. Husband, if you cannot learn by God's grace to say no to sin when it asks for your eyes, your marriage will die. Mom, if you cannot learn to give forgiveness to your husband because Christ has forgiven you by grace, and yet you choose to walk into the cell of bitterness and unforgiveness, your marriage will die. And God says, by my grace, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to look at that. You don't have to feel that way because you've been permanently and completely justified in Christ before God. And so he asked this question, next slide, why in the world, why in the world would you choose to live as a slave when God invites you by the wonderful, overflowing, rich powerful reality of grace. And the tension that you and I feel that Paul's going to elaborate on next week is this. If I am free from grace, why do I continue to live as a slave to sin? Because flesh is coming up and saying, give me your eyes. And he keeps saying yes. And last week, we gave you some, some steps to say no. I love Matt Chandler. Anybody ever heard of Matt Chandler? Matt Chandler gives us a phenomenal illustration. He talks about how he pastors a, a huge church, village church in Texas. And he moved in his, he stayed in the same town, but he moved from one house to the other. And so he had had a busy day at work. Uh, can you believe that? Pastors actually work. Haha. <laughs> but anyways, okay. And he had a busy day at work and he was just kind of going over the meetings and all of that. And so he got in his car and before he knew it, he pulled into the driveway of his old house. And without thinking, he got out of his car and he opened the door and he walked in. And the new owners of the house kind of looked at him like, and then when he walked in and he saw the new owners, all of a sudden he recognized, I don't live here anymore. And he said, for about six weeks, there was this one intersection where he used to live on one side of the town and he lived on another. For six weeks, he would have to specifically think at that intersection, turn left, not right, because I don't live here anymore. See, what's happened is God saved you. You're justified in Christ. But in your mind, you're thinking, you're naturally just allowing what sin used to control. And you're going back and you're going back to the place that you used to live. And the Apostle Paul would say this, listen, you're dead to sin. You don't live here anymore. Your eyes don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to feel that way anymore. You have a new address. And your new address was made possible, and a new house that you live in was purchased by the blood of Jesus. You are in Christ. So every time sin comes and says, let me have your arm, all right? You, listen, no, no, no. Because I'm dead to sin, but I'm a what? Alive to God. I'm, I'm dismembering Mr. Potato Head up here, all right? Kind of a scary thought. So, what does this mean? There are three groups of people that we want to... So, what does Romans 6 mean? Number one, if you are here today, and I understand there are people that will flow through church and, and have a need and don't know exactly what that need is, and they'll check out Christianity. But here's what you know, that there is an overwhelming ruling desire in your heart. And without Christ, the Bible says that ruling desire is sin. And that sin 
makes you uh, dysfunctional. It makes you broken. And that's because you were born in Adam. And the hope today that Jesus gives to you through what happened, a historical event 2,000 years ago on on Mount Calvary, is is the God-man Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bore the penalty of your sin in his body on a tree so that you could be free from the eternal penalty of the sin, but even greater than that, the power of sin over you. And that relationship can be simply begun by entrusting and committing your entire life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing that you can do. You don't have to change anything. All you have to do right now to be justified is recognize that you are lost. I'm separated from God because of my sin. And through faith, I trust the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the Bible says the moment in your heart you commit your life to Christ, you are are set free from the power and the penalty of sin. And in a few minutes, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. There's a second group of people here. It's people who are justified. You're in Christ. But you would be frankly honest and say, listen, I know I'm in Christ, and I know sin comes and asks for my eyes. And i got to be honest, Kevin, I like it. I enjoy it. And, and it seems to be working for me right now where I can do my spiritual walk with Jesus. I have no doubt I'm justified in Christ, but I really don't want to deal with my sin because I'm managing it, I'm hiding it, I'm controlling it, I'm taming it. And quite frankly, what I would have to do or allow God rather to do, I, I don't think right now I'm willing to do that. Here's my advice to you. Sin harder. Sin more. Go deeper. Because there's going to come a point, because wherever there is sin, there's a shadow of death. And eventually, you are going to sin so much, and you are going to experience such catastrophic deaths in relationships and in your personal life, that just like the prodigal son in the pit, there will come a day when you reach the bottom where, I love what the Bible says, he came to his, remember what he said? Census. He came to the conclusion that Paul is warning us of, why in the world, with my dad who is so wealthy and so respected and quite frankly so good, would I choose to run away from him and literally eat what pigs eat? Listen, I know my dad loves me, and the least I can do is go back, and surely he'd make me a servant. And here's the truth, that when you get so low in your sin, and you experience so much pain and so much catastrophe, here is what is so amazing about God's grace. You will come back, and when God sees you, he will run out to meet you. And the sooner you go deep in your sin, the sooner you sin harder, the, the, the more you allow it to own you, the quicker you'll reach such a despair where you will come to your senses. But let me ask you, what more has to die? What more has to suffer? What more has to be broken for you to realize? Why in the world, when you are completely free, Do you continue to wake up with the shame and guilt knowing you're hiding that secret from your spouse? Because when she finds out, when she finds out, you could blow everything up that you treasure. Or, repent. Repent. Be honest with God and say, I am so weak. I am so weak that I could no way go down to that bar. Because if I go down to that bar, it doesn't remain a Coke, it's a Coke and Jack. Now, I don't know what that is. The other pastors have informed me, all right? I'm the most naive pastor on staff. Right, Jerry? Okay, I thought Coke and Jack was a different kind of soda. It's not. Oh, imagine that, okay? And that's true, isn't it, guys? I had no idea. And you know if you go by that cubicle, your eyes will look at something that grace never destined you to look at. 
And you know if you get on and reacquaint with that old relationship from high school, it is robbing your marriage of what God in His grace has given you. And Paul would say, listen. No! No, you cannot have my eyes. No, you cannot have my family. No, you cannot have my heart. No, you cannot have my mind. And when you and I begin to live, and not just believe in grace, but through grace-driven effort, make these difficult choices. You're free. You're free. You're free. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? For the person that's here and doesn't know Jesus, today's the day. There are many people in here. You remember the overwhelming feeling of the Holy Spirit coming upon you when you said yes to Jesus. How many of you remember that? I will never forget that. That was 13. And the freedom, the burden, gone, gone, gone. For some of you, it is so foreign, that peace you had with God years ago when you were justified. And it is so foreign because you feel like sin owns you. Sin is pulling the puppet strings on you. And you cannot imagine a life without, and you fill in the blank. Today, by God's grace, let sin have a throwdown. Let, let grace have a throwdown with your sin and be free. And all you have to do, by God's grace, is say no. Thirdly, if you're here, and, and man, I'll tell you, I, I got to practice this this week. The temptation came, and literally under my breath, I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. Some of you, the proximity of your temptations, you cannot help but avoid. It is your workplace. It is your home. Your, your temper is so easily touched off when kids make a mess. Imagine. God, I pray my kids will never make a mess for the rest of their life. Amen. Hate to discourage it. That prayer ain't going to be answered, okay? So if that prayer ain't going to be answered, I'm going to have to learn how to let grace grab a hold of my lips that just want to unload on my kids. And so when that temptation comes and you start doing, remember Bill Bixby, you're not going to like me when I get mad. All right, and your, mom, your wife sees a shirt starting to split and your face is starting to cut, that weird tone of green. I'm dead to sin, but I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to God. I mean, your, your kids will be joining their hands. Daddy's dead to sin and alive to God, man. They'll be happy about it. Or, or, or you can do this. You can go off on your family in the morning and say things to your wife that will permanently scar her heart. And you can try calling her and she's so mad at you that she won't answer the phone. And you can text her and she's so frustrated with you that she won't respond in text. And you'll go days without speaking. And Paul would say, How? why would a D6 Christian home choose to live this way. Don't you know you are dead to sin and alive to God? Next week, listen, and I know you're busy. I know you're so important that you're busy. We are going to go through Romans chapter 7, and I'm saying if you need to be here for Romans 7. Here's the encouraging thing. Paul had this battle too. Paul had struggles saying no to sin. And if one of the greatest Christians who ever lived struggled with it, let's walk through the struggle with him. But I love the end of chapter 7. Thanks be to God who gives us the B-I-C-T-O-R-Y. All right, there you go. Victory through our Lord. Sorry, I know. That's an image you'll never get out of your mind. You'll need counseling with Matt and Jerry afterwards, all right? But what if, what if we decided as a church, as a community of faith believers, that I am done saying yes because I am dead to sin and I am alive to God? Would you, would you bow your heads just for real quick? I want to get you out of here. The question I have for you today is you're here and you're unsure that you are justified before God. You, you are not confident that if you, God forbid, would breathe your last breath 
you would wake up in glory. Today is the day of salvation. Why would you put off being free from sin? If that is you, would you raise your hand? No one is looking around. The last thing Kevin Carr is going to do is embarrass you, but you are unsure. Keep the lights up, please. If you are unsure, would you raise your hand? We do not want anyone leaving without an opportunity to be justified before God. And you say, Kevin, I'm just unsure. Would you hold your hand up? I won't call you out. I won't sing you out. Okay. Second question. Now I want you to be brutally honest with me. People were in first service. You're here and you know the very thing that sin is going to come right to your doorstep and say, give it, give it back to me. You, you had it Sunday morning, but now it's, it's time. Give it back. And, and you want to, but you don't know how you'll be able to say no to sin this week. And I got to be honest with you, Kevin, I'm weak. And, and I, I, my, right now my desire is strong to resist, but I fear I'm just going to, I'm going to fail and I need prayer. If that's you, would you hold your hand up? You say, Kevin, I'm, the, the heart is strong, but the flesh is weak and I'm tired of giving in. Would you hold your hand up? Would you be honest before God? Okay. I, I, want, I want to ask another question. Is there someone here that says, I am in church, but I like my sin, and I'm really not to a point where I am ready to deal with my sin, but I know I need to. Would you pray with me? Would you raise your hand? You say, I like my sin, and I just want to hold on to it, and I'm not, I, I need pushed by the Holy Spirit. Would you raise your hand? Please, hold it up. Okay. Thank you for being honest. How many of you are here and are tired of having to apologize to your family because you can't control your mouth? Let me rephrase that. How many of you are here today and you're tired of apologizing to your family because you don't let grace win? And I am tired of it. And I am ready to make a significant change in it. I am tired of confessing my sin of lust before God. And I want to have victory over it. I am tired of living like I'm functionally a slave to sin. And by God's grace, I want to know peace and freedom with God. If that is you, would you hold your hand up? I am tired of living this way. It's time for a change. It's time to be free. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray. And then uh, I'm going to hang around the front. And if there's someone here that just wants to talk, we're, we're here for you. But today, if everyone can look up. If everyone can look up. So according to the question, most all of us are justified before God. Here, here's the phrase. Here's what we're going to do this week. We are going to take our struggle with sin and we are going to marinate it. We are going to overdose. We are going to saturate it in this big thought this week. Here you go. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. So when you're in that area where here it comes, and, and you can hear literally the, 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 the heels of sin walking down the hallway to come and have a conversation, here's what you're going to say. I am dead to sin. I'm alive to God. Here we go. Say it with me. Here we go. Let's practice. I'm, I'm a... Okay, you go in to Tipton's graduation and you got grandma with you and someone runs over grandma to get the good seat. All right, here you go. And the words are getting ready to come out. I am... <laughs> okay, all right, someone takes that parking spot, all right, you, you had a cupcake left over from an open house, and you put it in a refrigerator at work, and that person before your lunch eats that cupcake, right, and they come out and they have the icing on their lips, who ate my cupcake? I don't know, and you're like, I'm, but, okay, or you can hit her and then confess, no, all right, no. Okay. In all seriousness, when we begin to think that way, when we overdose on this, when we saturate our mind with this, I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, I don't have to say yes to sin because I am. And what? Man, if, if you can teach, D6 parents, if you can teach your kids this concept, you will save your kids all kinds of pain and suffering. But greater than that, if we as a church can model this for our kids, they will want to say no to sin and yes to God. Father, you are good and your word is awesome. And Father, why in the world, why in the world is justified sons and daughters of God 
would we want to go back and lock ourselves up as slaves to sin? Father, all it produces is shame and guilt. All it does, Father, is kill relationships. Father, all it does is drive barriers, Father, where fences, where where bridges were to be built. Father, today, by God's grace, for the hands that were raised, we're each at a different place in growing in your grace, but Father, by the name and power of Jesus that rose from the grave and holds victory over death and sin. Father, help us to not only believe in your grace, but this week to live out that grace by, Father, being reminded, saturated, overdosing on the truth that, Father, we are dead to sin, but alive to God. Go before us in your holy name. And all God's people said,